uh, we're, we're going out with a bang because um, I have a, a really awesome guest today uh, to interact with everyone. And, and just again, a quick heads up, we are live on Facebook uh, and in the Zoom room. In the Zoom, we have some uh, guests here, which is great. I hope they ask questions and interact with us uh, during the presentation. And then also we're live on Facebook. So if you have questions on uh, Facebook, just put them in the comments. And if you're here on the Zoom, you're welcome to use Q&A or blurt out your question at any point in time, but we're perfectly fine with that. Um, but again, we're ending the year strong. I'm super excited to have with us uh, my new friend, uh, Tyrone Robinson. Tyrone, how are you doing today? I can't complain at all, Zach. Thanks for having me. Indeed, indeed. And Tyrone always comes with the polished uh, background. Uh, I never know where he is. Like sometimes I'm just assuming he's like on vacation, just chilling out in, in, in Florida and in, in somewhere fancy. Um, but, but are you home or are you, you out and about right now, Tyrone? In 2020, I'm always home. Okay. <laughs> and that's the safe way to play it, my man. Absolutely. The safe way to play it. Uh, let me give you folks just a quick little background on Tyrone. Uh, Tyrone is the owner of Opportunities to Serve LLC. Uh, for the last seven years, uh, Tyrone has been helping business owners all around the world start, fix, or save, and or scale and grow their business primarily through operations and strategy consulting and services. Mr. Robinson here has more than 10 years of experience developing, managing, and leading programs, organizations, and small businesses. He is fervently passionate about building and creating world-class businesses and organizations that significantly impact the success and satisfaction of their employees, internal and external customers, shareholders, and communities. Tyrone holds degrees from Delaware County Community College and Mansfield University with certifications from the University of California, the Irvine Extension, and the University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton School. Now, I said all a lot. I'm going to say what I want to say now. Tyrone's just a good dude. Uh, I had a chance to meet him in a networking event. We connected, uh, had a one-on-one -on -one chat, and he kind of has the same philosophy that I have towards building relationships and connecting with people. He is a giver. He wants to help you and not just help you as in you use a service and he helps you, but genuinely understand who you need to meet, what your goals are. And if he can just connect you with someone else, he's willing to do that, which I always appreciate in meeting good people. So again, welcome to the program, Tyrone. We are happy to have you. Uh, what, what, what's your opening remarks to the people? What do you want to say to folks? Uh, it's good to be here and thanks for supporting me and eventually sharing this with your networks as I think it'll provide a lot of value, especially as we move into 2021. Um, so I'm just hoping to get the word out there about how important it is to strategize and survive this uh, change of landscape. I love it. I love it. And uh, a change of landscape is needed. Um, 2020 uh, has been a very unique year, um, as evident of my uh, my fun picture here with a guy in an empty uh, place to eat with a mask on. Uh, we did not anticipate this at the beginning of the year, but you know we're in this spot now. Um, and I kind of wrote this together just to, to to look at the scope that from hospitality to sports, restaurants to tourism and beyond, all industries have been significantly impacted by the COVID nineteen pandemic, and as a result businesses have to pivot to survive and, and differentiation has never been more important than it is now. So a big thing we're gonna talk about is what differentiation is, um, give you some examples, give you some techniques towards how to do it. Um, but I'll let kind of Tyrone kick it off and give us his definition of differentiation and why it is so important to people. Well, in this case, um, we're talking about creating an opportunity for your business to become an industry standard, meaning you're not building upon the same key factors that your competitors are also building upon or investing in. Um, so another way to look at this is you're attempting to carve out new or uncontested market space within your existing industry. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And, and what's, what's your take on Kevin on differentiation and how that's important? I, I think that's always important, you know, when it comes to when it comes to branding, I mean, you know, that, that's always and branding is more than just a logo, you know, branding is, you know, the entire essence of your business. And that's always the first thing that we talk about is what differentiates you. And, and that could be as, as big as, you know, what are you offering that your competitors are not offering, or, you know, a little bit smaller, but of how do you do it, you know, that you may just be doing things slightly in a different way. Maybe you're all offering the same thing, but you're able to just add a little bit to it or do things in just a little bit different of a way. 
and that's something that can sometimes resonate with you know with an audience when it's presented correctly. So I think that that's always a big issue. And then you know obviously today, you know with with this you know pandemic that we're all in. I mean if, if you're not thinking that way, you've probably already you know shut the doors, unfortunately. Right. Right. So. Um, in, in terms of get, jumping into this conversation about differentiating, uh, you know, yourself, when I was speaking with Tyrone, this word divergence, you know, came up and about these key areas of divergence that are going to help you actually do this. These are these different areas that you want to focus on change. So thinking outside the box is, is key to differentiating your business. When building your strategy, it's important to look at these key areas of divergence. And I'm going to actually throw them all out here because uh, you can talk about these in a myriad of orders and they all kind of relate to one another. But we'll, we'll kind of try to start with, you know, what can we raise? And, and what does this mean to you, Tyrone, in terms of these areas of divergence and, and some of these that we have bulleted here? All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spin this around and I'm going to just throw this all at you. And mm -hmm. if you have a question, shoot it back. Um, so when I talk about those areas of what can we raise, reduce, create, and eliminate, in its context, we're talking about amongst those key factors that your industry may be competing on. So here, the objective is to create commercially compelling new or uncontested market space by redefining the playing field of the strategy. So one of the ways you can do this is through developing alternative strategic, strategic options that achieve differentiation and low cost by eliminating, reducing, raising, and creating key factors that break the value cost trade-off. Uh, so you may be asking, what's the value cost trade-off? It's the view that a company has the choice between creating more value for customers, but a, at a higher cost or a reasonable value for customers at a lower cost. In this context or a conversation, we're looking to achieve differentiation and at the same time, low cost. Uh, so a great way to get started with this process is for you to take a hard look at the way your business configures its offerings to its buyers in relation to those um, that you're gonna be calling competitors. You wanna be able to visualize where and what you and your competitors are currently competing on and investing in. Uh, these key factors should be described from the buyer's point of view, asking yourself, what do buyers in your industry gain from each key factor? Um, so questions you can ask yourself um, in this context still is, uh, understand where you are now you know, where are you now? Who are you now? And who you are not now? Um, I think all of those questions are valuable because there are really good answers if you're able to really take a step back and look at everything as a whole. So um, we have some examples coming up where I can kind of jump into this. But like I said, in this case, we're talking about, again, focusing on where your business is spending it's assets and resources, essentially. And this is time, energy, finances, et cetera. Um, so, you know, most people, when they look at these key factors, that number one key factor that they are uh, differentiating on is price. However, price is just one of those pieces. It's up to you to determine, again, where your industry competitors are focusing, where you're focusing, and how you can unlock uh, additional value or create new value in your offering or service or product. Got you. And, and the way that I kind of look at it um, from, from, you know, what I was taught and, and what kind of practice college instilled in me was doing these uh, SWOT analysis is what they called them. It was your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And this seems like almost a, a, a similar sort of a strategy is you know, doing that self-evaluation and understanding of what you're offering, what you're providing, and seeing where those areas that you can change and tweak for the future are. Um, you know, I, I assume you see that same comparison, uh, Kevin, but what's kind of your take on, you know, these key points, you know, what we can raise, what we can reduce, what we can create, and what we can eliminate, and how that will help a business actually grow and, and differentiate themselves? Yeah, for sure. You know, in, in theory, it's something that we should probably be thinking about, you know, constantly anyway, you know, you, you should always be trying to better yourself. Obviously, this year is, you know, it's that much more important if you don't reduce that waste. And if you don't, you know, you know, make the adjustments you need to, as I said before, I mean, you're, you're done, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's harder than ever right now. 
Um, you know, I think, you know, when Tyrone was going through his list and he was saying, you know, and he was saying, you know, what, what do we do, you know, with, with this and that, if you haven't already thought that way, then the next question is, where do we need to be? You know, and, and maybe, maybe you work backwards. You haven't figured out what to reduce. You haven't figured out what to create, but let's look at the current landscape. Let's look at what our clients, customers, or potential audience, you know, what do they need? And then how do we get there? You know, so how do we adjust for them or how do we adjust internally? We need to cut our expenses by X percent. Okay, now let's evaluate how can we do that? You know, there may be certain things that your business needed last year and your business is going to need next year, but we just don't need it this year. Um, you know, we went through an exercise. We have a lot of our team working from home right now, you know, on the Navitas side that, you know, we're lucky. We've got the technology. We've got the ability to, to work from home and everybody's you know, doing a great job and we don't have people in the office. Well, guess what? There are certain expenses that we're able to cut right now that I sure hope we are paying for again next year when we bring everybody back to the office. But right now, there's no reason to pay for that stuff if, if it's not being used. You know, and then that, that's the kind of thing where, you know, you, you cut where you can and when it's time, you know, we'll, we'll bring it back. Perfect. Uh, perfect example, Kevin. I popped into the office uh, a few weeks ago because I was getting my car done in the area and I was like, I'm just going to go over to the water cooler and get a nice cup of water and there's no water cooler. <laughs> and I was like, where's the jug? And I'm used to it being there because everyone was drinking water, but with no one in the office, you don't have to go out and buy water jugs anymore. And that's just one very small example. but making those adjustments is key. And I think in this process of figuring out these different areas of divergence, I think it's really important in a year like this to do that reevaluation because your customer's needs may have changed. Um, yes, your, your ability and what you're able to do may change as well. But if you're not adjusting to the new life or the new buying pattern or anything that your customer is dealing with, you know, you, you'll likely have a hardship in, in trying to, to maintain your business. Yeah, I actually did an exercise just yesterday. Um, you know, we, we have our voiceover IP service and, you know, in today's world, it's always subscription. You're paying per line for that voiceover IP. Well, guess what? We've got conference rooms right now that aren't being used, but we've got phones in there and we have desks for where our interns usually sit that, you know, right now we do have interns, but they're working remotely and they don't need extensions, you know, in our office. So those you know, there are a couple phones throughout the office that we're paying, you know, a decent amount for each month that we really don't need. And, you know, I'm probably going to be returning those phones. And again, you know, if and when we all return to the office, I'll get those phones back again. But if we can cut that expense right now, why shouldn't we? Indeed, indeed. Well, um, sorry, Comcast. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> they, they have enough money, Kevin. They'll, they'll be good. No, uh, I'm, not, I'm not feeling too guilty about it. Fair. <laughs> Uh, so one thing, Tyron, we, we talked about, um, you know, in preparing this was really understanding pain points, because, um, you know, that's where a lot of um, the opportunity with potential customers will stem from. Um, and pain points are these areas of business that buyers are typically forced to deal with that make it harder for them and in all capacities, whether it be making a purchasing decision, um, staying with a current provider as opposed to switching to another one. These pain points always really come up there. Um, and all industries have them. So a really big key is identifying yours and developing solutions. And these are the four main pain points uh, that we identified. And I've had run-ins with every single one of these pain points. But Tyrone, give us some details on, you know, maybe how you can identify these pain points and some of the ways that you would go about differentiating yourself by focusing on these pain points. All right. So almost every industry or business has significant problems worth solving. Uh, a pain point, and I want to give a definition kind of as I see it, a pain point is a block to utility or a negative experience that buyers face and lowers the frequency of the products or services usage and or discourages people from patronizing the industry. Pain points are aspects of the business product or service that buyers knowingly or not are forced to put up with and which either diminish its utility in their eyes or are so inconvenient that non-customers turn to alternatives. Pain points can exist for current customers, but they also exist for buyers who do not currently participate in the market. Uh, these pain points are reasons why customers are dissatisfied and buyers refuse to participate in your industry. 
So in this approach, we want to take a look at the full range of experiences buyers have in using your or the target industry or business's product and services. We're looking to solve problems the industry has failed to address, highlighting pain points worth solving, and conversely, the levers that could be pulled to address and unblock exceptional utility and value. Uh, some of the levers we are looking to create solutions for include productivity, simplicity, convenience, fun and image, risk reduction, and environmental friendliness. Um, so when we look at that short list that you have as far as time, cost, trust, and level of service, a lot of these particular pain points can apply to a number of industries. However, there are is a good amount of overlap. You know, if we look at time, cost, and trust, and level of service, we can apply that to the legal services. We can apply that to financial services, right? These, um, these kind of industries that are very slow to change. Um, a lot of this, uh, when, you're, when you're a consumer, it basically looks like, if we look at cost, you know, as a business owner, we probably all should have a legal team of some sort. However, cost is one of those barriers or challenges and or the model that people offer us, um, which means in most cases, business owners are actually having the pain at the time that they contact the lawyer, as opposed to having the lawyer and avoiding the pain. So, you know, it's a significant pain point that anybody will tell you. I mean, almost everybody will describe that as being one of the barriers or challenges to entering that industry. Um, when it comes to trust, right, you can apply that also to legal. You can also apply that again to financial, where you're saying to yourself, you know, is this person caring about me and my financial freedom and my family? Or is this person pushing products and services for their benefit to their family and themselves? Um, again, when you look at just these four examples, you can pull out a number of reasons that you yourself haven't done business with some of these right. industries or reasons that you've probably heard many people give you about not doing business in these industries. So the real opportunity here is to be able to figure out, again, how to uh, create opportunities within these pain points. And again, most of this comes by way of blocks to productivity, simplicity, convenience, fun and image, risk reduction, and now we'll say environmental friendliness. Gotcha, gotcha. And I'm gonna ask, start with you, Kevin, but I'm gonna ask you know, if, if one of the folks who's on the Zoom with us will give us an example as well. Um, but Kevin, give me an example of either a scenario where you as a customer came across one of these pain points and it affected your decision um, and, and even maybe a recommendation of what they should have or could have done differently um, or an example of a pain point that you noticed you had with your business that a customer was having and how you resolved that. You can, you can answer either one and I'll ask some of the folks uh, on, on the uh, Zoom to chime in with, uh, with theirs as well. Yeah, yeah, good, good question, good loaded question. Thanks for making me go first. <laughs> um, now, you know, it, when, it, when it comes to understanding, you know, pain points, I mean, that's what business is all about, right? I mean, you're, you want to identify your target audience, you want to know who's in your audience, what does, you know, what, what, what does that persona look like? Um, you know, and that, that could be, you know, everything from demographics to, um, you know, positions within a particular company, if you're dealing, if you're B2B, um, you know, what do their families look like? What does their education level look like? You know, everything that goes into that. And then, you know, part of that is, you know, what are their pain points? You know, why, why would they need you? So, you know, when you think about, you know, us as a marketing agency, I mean, you know, on the you know, 10,000 foot view, you know, what is their pain point? Usually it's their, they don't have enough business. They want more business. They want more brand recognition. They want to get their name out there better. And, you know, that's why you go to a marketing agency, you know, because we're there to help you, you know, accomplish that. Um, you know, why do you get a new website? Because my website is old, because I can't manage my website, because I, I'm not getting enough traffic to my website. I'm not getting enough conversions once people are on my website. And, you know, our job is to understand, you know, why are those pain, why do those pain points exist? And then how do we help them through that and, and make that better? You know, it's, 
And we know, A, you know, and, and I'm keeping it simple, but, you know, they need a new website. Okay, great. There's an initial pain point of I'm not getting enough out of my website and I need something better. Then there's also the pain point of I don't have the time to invest in this new website, even though I know we need it. And our job is to make that process as easy as possible. So it's not just we're going to give you something that's so much better to reduce that initial pain point, but then the pain that you're going to feel going through this process, our job is to minimize that as much as possible. And, and to add one more on to that, Kevin, when you don't have the time, you then need to trust more the expertise of who you're working with, and then trust could become another pain point in dealing yeah. with that issue. Yeah. But I know a lot of people who we've talked to about doing websites, and it isn't their first website. Yep. They did it with someone else. At some point, they didn't trust or didn't trust them, had an issue, and don't like the end product. Um, so even levels of service, all these pain points usually can get wrapped up into one particular issue. Yeah. Um, now, even though you gave me all that, Kevin, I don't think you actually gave me an example. So I'm going to let you slide and see if anyone else wants to give me an example of either a pain point that they had within their business and solved or uh, a pain point they had as a customer uh, dealing with another business and whoever, you know, has something you can just open up and chime in. I see Dave just got off of, uh, off. Of hey, Zach. Hey, Dave. Hey, everybody. So I'm speaking for my, my owner, since I'm the national sales manager and I asked, I don't think he's on board here, Barry, but, uh, Tyrone, uh, you know, knows him, but I would say uh, one of more of his pain points that, that I know of is, is, uh, you know, he has to buy our products in large amounts, containers. We, we do buy some things overseas. So I, I think sometimes our inventory is high uh, and I'll just give you an example. So when you use the word pivot earlier, our normal business is, you know, backpacks and school supplies and hygiene kits and things like that. But we entered the COVID business back in February or March and, 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 and did very well at it. Now we still have a lot of that product, you know, to move it. And I think initially people have gotten their, their dispensers and their sanitizer. Now we are seeing some reorders, but when all this is said and done and everybody's vaccinated, what do we do with that stuff that's left over? You know what I mean? So that's a tough position that he's in. Uh, so I, I know that's a pain point and I would have to say time is definitely, uh, something because he doesn't have the time for anything. And I do believe he could use a new website and me and Tyrone and Barry have already talked about that. Uh, but that's all I, have, I wanted to say right now. Thank and you. Let me ask you, Dave, is that a recurring pain point or is it more a pain point just specifically because of this year and, and that? Yeah, year? I, I think I think more this year because the other goods he can buy, you know, sometimes you get better and, you know, we work with pennies. So sometimes you know, a trailer load of X can save you a little money so we can give more value to the customer. Uh, our regular goods is no problem because we turn. But now sitting on something like this, that basically, you know, to survive, he, he needed to get into because you're, you're having COVID, who, who's buying backpacks? And, and, you know, I mean, there's always people helping those in need is what we do and helping the homeless. But, uh, you know, he's got high rent, you know, he's, you know, it's a big warehouse and uh, things like that. So I feel his pain being here in New Jersey as, uh, you know, we're a small company. There's only like eight or 10 of us there, uh, you know, and they're building the kits and I'm, I cover the United States and, you know, me and him. And, and uh, I, I do, I definitely feel his pain. Uh, sometimes it comes through with, you know, we, 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 we got to try to move some product and, and sometimes I feel like, uh, what's the, you know, uh, what's the term? Uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. Right. You know, like setting out those blasts that I did in February and March really worked for me. I had 135 sales in those six months to schools all over the country. Really, really good sales. But now I'm continue to send them out. Like I might have changed some things, not getting anything back. Mm -hmm. So I want to stop the insanity, <laughs> you know, I need to do something different. So, and, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why I, I join networking groups and just reaching out to people individually and doing one-on-ones and finding out what they're about and needs and, 
and things, people like Tyrone, you know, and just uh, just getting to know people and what they do and, and how I can help them. So, so let you. me jump in. Um, thanks, Dave. Yep. What, what Dave shared was from their perspective as a business. However, in that example, the pain point that he described as far as um, having to buy more product than they may need is a pain point that is placed on them by the vendors. So that example, you know, we can take that and look at, all right, if I am the vendor, how can I make that easier for the end user to then go ahead and make a more uh, economical, feasible decision in one hand, but also get exactly what they want. Now, in this case, it just may not make a lot of sense. S-E-N-S-E-C-E-N-T-S, either way for the vendor to lower their numbers. However, there are some ways to kind of, per vendor relationship, there are ways to lower that price. However, to answer this question, uh, the vendor themselves would have to figure out a way to make purchasing more simple, more feasible, more convenient. Mm -hmm. Um, And those are a few of those different ways that I spoke about earlier. So, you know- And timely. Exactly. So in all of these examples, uh, even though he's speaking from the business owner's point of view, they are buyers in this process. And in that process, there are a number of pain points that have yet to be answered. And in this case, on purpose, um, because the vendor wants to be able to make their money and also have the safety and support that they need to be able to support their operations. so thank you, Dave, for that. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's like, you know, and, and and I'm talking about dealing with overseas. So I don't know how easy that is to, you know, uh, cut orders in half and get less. So you're not tying up your money in inventory, you know. So I just. Well, they're taking a lot of things into account, everything from shipping, packaging, oh, and yeah. so on and so forth. So, yeah. you know, the numbers are the numbers. Um, But again, your example provides a really good opportunity for someone anywhere in the world to be able to take a look at the issues people are facing and say, you know what, there's got to be a better way to do this. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, and again, I'm speaking for Barry. Uh, You know, if if you don't have a million dollars of inventory tied up that you're not turning, you can be using that million dollars elsewhere, you know. For, for you know other things that are that I feel are important but uh you know like again I'm, I'm speaking for Barry he's the owner and, and my best friend so sometimes I gotta tread lightly but I say but uh you know it, it's all good and uh you know hopefully down the road uh me him and Tyrone can uh, get together and uh and figure some things out yeah, I know one one thing we do, which is you know not, not exactly your situation, Dave, but but similar. We, so we have a printing company as well called the Homer Group, We're not just a marketing agency. And you know, very often there are print jobs. You know, there are certain jobs where you really need to buy that that higher quantity in order to get better unit costs. And we have clients that understand that and know that they will use that volume, but they just don't have the space for it. You know, they they want to buy the, the higher quantity, but you know it's it, just too much you know what are they going to do with it and then what we usually do is we try to help our clients by saying go with the higher quantity let's do the bigger print job whether it be for promotional products or pocket folders or whatever that product is where they really do need the higher volume but then we'll only ship 25 percent of the order to them or half the order to them and we'll keep the rest in our warehouse so that way they've gotten the better unit cost but they don't have to sit there with pallets and pallets of materials in their office where it doesn't fit. And then just as they need it, we'll send it to them. So that way the client's happy because they're getting the better volume pricing. And we're happy because we're making a customer happy and they, you know, we, we're, it's for the sake of the relationship. Everybody wins at the end. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, we call we call that in the industry. I spent 35 years in retail. I was a regional manager for BJ's. You want more truck to shelf. Than tying up your tying up your steel, uh, but but I don't know if he if he has that capability, 
Yeah, yeah I, I don't that's, know. that's a perfect world. That's perfect world right there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, give me a good price. You hold it for me till I need it. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, you know, just trying to get, you know, for the sake of the conversation, just an yeah. example of, you know, how can you, you know, identify a customer's pain point and, you know, try to find, as the vendor, try to find that solution for them. Right. Yeah. So, Thank you. I'll help you, but, uh, but good, good luck. Cause I know this is a, it's a common problem that a lot of businesses have. I'm sure, yeah. And we, and we got inventory. It's 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 tough. And we got one from uh, Steve. I saw I saw Steve even gave the hand raise. Yeah, well, we were talking about pain points. You know, I just went through this as a buyer. Um, our heater went. We had to get a heater. Well, I know nothing about it. And all those things came in time. We needed it because fortunately it's been warm, but it went that Friday and it was going to be freezing that Sunday. So you go start shuffling around for your 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 loss. Then luckily. I went through Facebook and put up a thing and people started contacting me the names and you call people and they say, we can't do it until this. And I got a guy, he had a good cost, you know, and that's another thing, cost, you know, you talk to PSE and G, they want to charge you, you know, three times, whatever. I was like, you got to be joking me. Well, that's yeah. like, you know, cause, cause they had the thing where it's like, you can pay in plans. And I'm like, dude, I'm going to pay cash for it. And then trust, you know, you got to get someone, you know, you have to recommend, I had to go through all that stuff. And it all turned out great. You know, I got the guy after contacting different people. I got the guy out in um, in a matter of he did a red, he did a estimate. I had him in like in six days. And it's you know as for pain points as a buyer when you reach out when you don't know anything about something, it's uh, it's helpful when the person you're dealing with brings you through it. Yeah, yeah. I have to say, Steve, it just I, I think trust. Is you is huge, uh, it just a huge one of those one of those points, because uh, it well it's just a if you trust somebody you know it's just a good thing and and you continue to do business with them, so you want to be trustworthy as a as an owner of a company or you know running a business and you want to be able to trust people so yeah yeah I'm gonna put my marketing hat back on but. Um... You know, they, they say that in today's world, 80% of the sales process is complete before the initial interaction with the business. And that means that the consumer or potential consumer is looking to build that trust with the business before they even reach out to the business, before they even talk to them. So, you know, something like you're getting a new heater installed and you have, or you know, you need a new heater installed and you know absolutely nothing about the process, having content on a company's website that provides that information about how the process works and about the, the various manufacturers and models and everything. It allows you to educate yourself before reaching out. And, you know, you happen, they happen to be building your trust. Uh, another thing is online reputation management. People are doing, you know, they're going on Facebook and asking in Facebook groups, you know, who do you guys use locally? They know, you know, you're looking at different review engines, uh, you know, depending what industry, you, you know, it, it's in. And, you know, again, why are you looking at those reviews? Because you're trying to build that trust. So, you know, th there are so many different ways that businesses can build trust with a potential audience before you even talk to them for the first time. Because when someone finally reaches out to you, again, 80% of that sales process is, only, is already complete. They already feel pretty confident in you. That trust has already been built. And now it's your job just to make sure you don't screw it up. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. I'm, I'm loving. Uh, I'm loving this discussion. We got some uh, some good uh, back and forth going on here. Um, we're gonna jump to this last page before we open it up for additional questions. Of course, if you're watching on Facebook, please feel free to give a question. Uh, if you're here in the Zoom again, as you see, you can just jump in the combo. And for those who will be watching this in the future on YouTube, uh, below the video, we're gonna have Tyrone's email, my contact, Kevin's contact. So if you want to reach out to us, uh, then you can as well. Um, but Tyrone, so the last thing we touched on was we were actually talking about some case studies to give some examples. And uh, the cool thing is we went for like really big brands because even nationwide brands have issues with differentiating themselves, sometimes resulting in complete bankruptcy. Um, so I'll put these all on the screen and, and we can break them down one by one, uh, you know, in whatever order you want, Tyrone. But give us a little bit about sort of this, uh, these case studies of differentiation and how you would kind of relate this to someone as a, as a good example. Oh, you're still on mute, Tyrone. 
Sorry about that. So in the case of um, the first example with Ringling Brothers and Circus Soleil, um, it's really clear to see that Circus Soleil came in after Ringling Brothers several hundred years <laughs> later um, and basically says, you know what? We're getting rid of the tents. We're getting rid of the clowns. We're getting rid of the animals. We're getting rid of the animal trainers. And if you're looking at those key factors again, about what it would have taken to be a circus or family entertainment. These are some of the key factors that Ringling Brothers would have had on their map. However, because Circus Soleil didn't invest that way, they obviously had more money to spend in other ways. They created an opportunity for that family engagement in a significantly different way that wasn't just to appeal to children, it appealed to the entire family and different age groups and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of Starbucks and Dunkin', um, Dunkin' had about a 20 year head start on Starbucks. Um, but among other things, Starbucks has built a more premium brand, has stores that look more like a comfortable coffee house, has a more extensive menu and greater product customization. Their baristas are trained to make over 40,000 combinations of whatever they have. Um, Duncan stores resemble more traditional fast food eateries and they offer more competitive pricing relative to Starbucks, meaning they invest in lower cost products that are quicker producing. They've been in the top two of all fast food chains for a number of years consecutively in terms of delivery speed. You make your order, you get it in under five minutes. Um, Blockbuster versus Netflix, it's kind of twofold, honestly. So originally Netflix's business model uh, was one that uh, delivered DVDs by, e by mail. Um, Netflix innovated in several ways. Ordering was done online, uh, monthly subscriptions where flat fees uh, were in existence. Um, what else? Uh, I think they had something around, you can get one to seven DVDs out at the same time without any late fees. Um, so the differentiator that stood out to most people in that case, no late fees. Um, other areas of differentiation that crept up over time, uh, unlimited online streaming, as far as Netflix is concerned. Um, you have thousands of movies and TV shows available for a low monthly cost. Um, their limitations as compared to Blockbuster are no stores or Dropbox kiosks and no video games available, right? Um, on the Blockbuster side, uh, they mail discs. The mail disc can be exchanged or could be exchanged in stores or at the kiosk. And we uh, recognize that Redbox and those other kind of competitors creep into that space as well to kind of zap Blockbuster's momentum. Um, however, they had some exclusive titles that you could get about 28 days before Netflix and Redbox. So another key differentiator. Uh, one of their limitations was not all blockbuster stores allow in-store exchanges. Um, discs obtained from an in-store exchange must be returned to that same store. Um, so that was a block to simplicity and productivity in some respects. Um, so, you know, all of these businesses, you notice <laughs> in many of these examples, they're either gone as far as the people who didn't adapt or they're on their way out. Uh, in the case of Duncan, with a 20 year head start, um, as things stand now, currently Starbucks generates over 26 billion a year in revenue. And I believe Duncan may be about one and a half billion by comparison. Uh, so they have a 20 year head start and they're $20 billion worse than their competitor, you know? Ringling Brothers, same thing, right? As consumer preferences shifted, the circus stood still. Uh, competition for family em entertainment exploded, but the only thing exploding at Ringling Brothers were animal rights lawsuits and labor disputes, right? Um, all that did was lead to a complete failure over time. Um, and then when we look at Blockbuster, again, if I'm, if I'm Blockbuster, in the early 90s, 
I would imagine it would have been pretty smart to recognize streaming services when they first crept around the corner in the late 90s in the form of Napster and the like. Um, I think Blockbuster should have been looking over their shoulder then, way prior to Netflix that came out maybe in 2007. Uh, so, you know, as you see, if you are a business that's standing still in a change of landscape, not even talking about the 2020 change of landscape, which is like hyperspeed, um, you'll be out of business. It's a guarantee, no matter how big you were. Um, so I think those are three really good case study examples. And we can all kind of relate. We've, we've probably spent money at most of these businesses and, or done business in a lot of these industries to be able to recognize the areas or the pain points that the business we are now doing business with solved for us to have a better opportunity to get what we wanted. So for family entertainment, Ringling Brothers dropped the ball. For the coffee industry at all, Duncan has dropped the ball. Um, when we look at Blockbuster, the ball is punted. I mean, nobody has even a, a, anything that isn't streaming related. I mean, I know I don't and I won't. So, you know, at the end of the day, the point here is, or maybe the uncomfortable truth is, 2020 is not a year not to have a plan or a strategy. And for every day that you go without one, there's someone else creating what you should have or already have had an opportunity to do. And so don't be surprised if you find yourself in a poor position moving forward, especially again in a year where everyone else in your industry is probably having this conversation. Mm -hmm. If they're planning on surviving and thriving, they're probably already at the table. And it's kind of arguable that if you're having that conversation right now, you're about eight months too late. You know, so, you know, I want to stress, you know, again, how important it is to recognize some of these larger companies because nobody is, you know, risk averse. You know, everybody is kind of, um, really tasked with figuring these questions out for their customers and they're changing expectations and needs. And there's probably never been a year in any of our lifetimes on this call where every industry is yeah. having the same conversation. Yeah, that, that's so true, Tyrone. And thank you for that great breakdown and, and examples. Um, I know me personally, I've spent money with all six of these businesses on here. Uh, I actually used to work at Blockbuster in 2005 and 2006. Uh, I'm kind of embarrassed to say. Um, and, and I want to recall, I, I don't remember the details, but didn't at one point, like Blockbuster have an opportunity to purchase Netflix for like, I don't know what the amount they was, did. but something where they like, did. I'm sure those people are, are killing themselves uh, 10 times over for not doing that. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, the book on Netflix, I believe the title is This Will Never Work. So there were a lot of people other than Blockbuster that may have looked at Netflix and said, this will never work. I'm sure that this will never work happened in the case of Uber and Lyft as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, do you think, you know, these companies like Cirque du Soleil and, and Starbucks became better than the others just because of someone being more visionary? Uh, like taking control of the helm. Like I know I was a general manager my last five years in retail for Wawa. Perfect example of they're so far ahead of other convenience stores, I believe, Absolutely. because of their consistency. So whether you like McDonald's food or not, they, they model themselves after McDonald's. That quarter pounder and that Wawa hoagie will taste the same in any store because that's how you make that sandwich. It's, it comes right on the screen. Like every, so every clerk or every, you know, person making a sandwich makes it the same in every single Wawa, the same way every quarter pounder. So, you know, everybody's gonna have a like, so you like McDonald's, you're gonna keep going there. You like Wawa, plus when the gas came along, forget it, one-stop shop. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean- no, that, that's, that's a great example, you know, Wawa is, constantly innovating. I don't know in another convenience store that innovates more than they do. 
you know? So if you look at the changes that have occurred almost every year in Wawa's offerings, products and services, it's easy to see why they have such a uh, stronghold, at least in this area. Um, it's almost really easy to see why. Yeah, I left However, there. In, I don't shop at Wawa. Okay, <laughs> I left. I left there in 2011, and I think at that time they were just hitting into Florida, and there's about 150 already in Florida. Wow. Oh, so course. they built a couple a week, like like you know what I mean, like they, and I think at that time they were about seven billion, and that was in five states. And I, well, no, you're, you're speaking to the standardization and uh, Starbucks is the same way, right? Like I said, Duncan had a, about a 20 year head start and right yeah. now Starbucks has a larger footprint with over 30,000 locations worldwide compared to Duncan who has about 11 and a half or less thousand locations. Right. So, you know, again, standardization is showing if, if we're taking that a little further, it's showing that standardization may be a key factor that you want to thrust into your business as far as a food service delivery model. So if we're in the food industry, we just stated two uh, businesses with high degrees of standardization versus competitors that don't have that. Duncan and 7-Eleven are very similar models. They're franchise models. Starbucks I'm not sure about Wawa, but I know Starbucks is corporately owned at least 70% of all their stores, which yeah, is- Yeah, so is Wawa. Okay, perfect. So again, that just proves the point that if you're in the these industries, standardization is a quality that we can prove in and out is something that provides a lot of value. Yeah, consistency yeah. goes a long way. Uh, you know. I would say to go a little deeper on that, in terms of the product offered, I would argue that just about every Dunkin' you go to, you're going to receive the same product, the same donut sandwich, relatively. But you may not product. receive the same level of service. And that's the part that differentiates them is that attention to detail, how you mm-hmm. feel. The, the thinking of customer first is what I would love about Starbucks. The fact that they can create 40,000 different beverages means no matter who you are, we're going to serve what you like and what you want. And right. the other business, Duncan, doesn't do that. Uh, do you want one cream or two cream? Like, like that's how customizing yeah. you get. Um, but it, it does support their model or their ability to get you in and out. It and does. that's what they're focused on. Hey, two creams or none. It's not, you know, I need this, I need that, I want this, I want that. Uh, go to Starbucks. <laughs> you know, they're literally living or, or working in a way that gives them the ability to serve in the way that they've apparently found to be most successful for them. Yeah, what- they really are two different models. So your Starbucks of the worlds are based on turns, turning the parking lot, turning the drive through, whatever. Okay, just to more customers. But you're talking about now. I never had a cup of coffee in my life, believe it or not, right? But you're talking about two different animals. I do know my kids drink. My go- girls drink. Like, am I wrong? Is Starbucks like four bucks or five bucks compared to a dollar or whatever they are? But people will pay, like you're saying, Zach, people will pay for that customer service. And right? What, what, you can go there. No, I'm just saying people will pay for that customer service because I know Starbucks is high end, like money wise, right? Versus a, a Dunkin' Donuts. I got you, Joe. So they don't mind pay, paying that. They're, they just built a drive through Dunkin' Donuts around a corner from me, right? Right around a corner. I counted 18 cars waiting the other day at four in the afternoon. I mean, I, I don't understand it because I don't drink coffee, but 18 cars at four in the afternoon. I thought coffee was just a morning thing, you know? But, <laughs> and who knows? Well, let me, who knows let me jump in real quick. So the Starbucks, well, the Dunkin' that you're speaking of, one of the ways they've differentiated and may have gone into what you saw at the time that you saw is that they've incorporated products uh, like steak sandwiches, right? That can serve as more than just breakfast opportunities. So they have increased their products in a way that they have opened up to a market 
that suggests that we're not just the before noon company, we are the noon and beyond as well. So again, a lot of what you're seeing is their targeted response to uh, Starbucks's success. However, Starbucks has great success. <laughs> and you know yeah. what they're doing is basically kind of uh, struggling to swim upstream, it, it would seem. Yeah, I will. I have to jump off. I got it like a one o'clock, but I will leave you with something. So one thing special about Wawa is, I don't know if you know this, but they work with an ESOP, Employee Stock Ownership Program. Those employees care. Okay. If you're in management for 20 years in a Wawa, you got more than a million dollars already saved up in that ESOP. Okay. Uh, it's a great company to work for if you don't like, you know, if you don't mind working the hours and all that stuff. And you can really move up with Wawa. They're a good company. I just, after 35 years of retail, I was, I was done because I, I went there later in my life. But, uh, you know, so, so when you're, you're giving your employees something to strive for, you're going to get good results. Yep. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And, and I think, uh, Jeff, you had something to add to the, uh, the combo. Yeah, this has been phenomenal, by the way. Tyrone, thank you for turning oh, me hey, on Jeff. to this. Hey, Dave, good to see you. Thanks, um, Jeff. Yeah, of course. Um, so I think a lot, a, a lot of this conversation, at least on this coffee end, um, boils down to, to customer experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, why people are willing to pay $4 for a cup of coffee that is um, mildly different than the $1.50 cup that you can get somewhere else and doing that over and over every day. Um, and Starbucks has done a phenomenal job through their consistency and through their delivery, right? Whether it's through the drive-through or through the, you know, the, the pickup to order that they first started doing five or six years ago, where you could order online, go in and get your coffee. They've always been that next step ahead of the competition. And Tyrone, to your point where Duncan has started to add like the, the steak um, to be that not just before, it, it does look like they're swimming completely upstream because you have the you have Starbucks who's been offering you know the 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 uh, plant based options and these other options to catering towards who they know they serve well and it almost seems that like Duncan is is coming after a broader market instead of really focusing on you know what let's serve that particular demographic really well um, and do it better than anyone else it's like they're trying to grab from Wawa grab from Starbucks and. It's probably because they lost market share to both of those companies as they've grown. Um, oh, absolutely. So really absolutely. neat discussion, guys. And, uh, you know, Duncan has incorporated the uh, Beyond Meat option within the last two years as a response. Um, they've incorporated the order from the app as a response, right? They're not leading any of these conversations. They're responding. And... 26 billion compared to 1.5 is as good as a loss as you can probably have yeah, while not being broke yeah I think, it I, think, I think an important point that you made a little while ago tyrone is corporate versus franchise mm -hmm. completely different animals 100 percent. Right. all right that dave stever that owns five dunkin donuts you know he might not care he's making his million a year whatever mm -hmm. you know what i mean where corporate, is, their vision's longer. I need to build 10 a year. I need to do this many, many per year, you know? Who knows the one Absolutely. company that's on all sides of these and is doing a great job. So they're, like in that Starbucks Dunkin' comparison, this brand is, is on both ends. They're, they're doing it corporate, but they're also a franchise. They give you the customer service. They give you the fast product. They're not open on Sundays. They're well, so so they're but they're doing chicken, like a baby chicken. But wait, but wait, they, wait, they do a hybrid model of that, right? Like I can't go buy six Chick Fil A stores. I think I Jeff would only be allowed to own one, and I don't own it. I think it's I, an app, yeah, the process of becoming an owner, like I, I know it's one of the most stringent um, applications possible. I don't know if he, I think religion even plays a factor into it. Like they're very much strict with who can own it and how you have to operate it and how you scale up like you can't just buy a bunch like you said um so those limitations i think help them with their quality control uh a great deal um but in here's general, the thing zach chick-fil-a has had the slowest 
service delivery time in the industry. Yeah. They are they are the very last. Really? So know that. the what, pieces just, that are a plus, yeah, they are still a plus. However, I, you're going to wait about eight to 10 more minutes for your order. But I feel like it's you that would long. at Dunkin' Donuts. I feel like the wait's that long because the line's so long. Like they came, they need more fryers. Like they can't even come <laughs> out the amount I of know. food that people are buying. I mean, it's wrapped around twice around the store. Uh, pay attention can... for in the future. Pay attention. Next yeah, time I gotta, you go to Chick fil A. I got to go. But thank you very much for having me. And maybe the, with seven of us left, let's chip in and get a Chick fil A. <laughs> I got 0.1% of it. <laughs> See you guys. See, See you, Dave. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, this, this has bye. been an awesome hour with with uh, with some great discussion. I think we're all um, you know probably ready to to wrap this up. I don't know if we have any last minute questions. I know we've had a lot of people uh, checking in on Facebook and watching, but no no questions. So I guess we're uh, we're crushing it with this discussion, but. Anybody who's with us on Zoom, do you guys have any questions? Anything, any last points, words of wisdom? Yeah, I have a question. Um, more, for marketing for nonprofit and with the with the way it is in 2020, the um, fundraising, we weren't able to do, well, we weren't able, we did one fundraising event. Um, how could our marketing help out with the uh, um, fundraising? Great question. It's the same question every nonprofit is trying to figure out right now. And, you know, obviously nonprofits, they, they're all, they all have a lot of similarities and they all, you know, have that level of differentiation as well. And it's kind of just figuring out again, where, where do your donations usually come from? And, you know, what does that demographic look like? And what, what's the best way to reach them? I know we've seen a lot of direct mail solicitations go out this year. Um, you know, at a necessity, you know, that they're not, you know, nonprofits aren't having their events, they're not having their typical fundraisers, and, you know, direct mail, USPS, that's, that's the one constant that, that has remained this year, you know, the mail still being delivered, so that, that's been one of the big pushes that, that we've seen, for sure, um, you know, Zach can probably speak to this a little bit as well, but definitely a lot of online events, I know we're all kind of, you know, zoomed out at this point, you know, that, it was, it was pretty exciting at the beginning of the pandemic. Now we've got a little bit of Zoom fatigue, but um, you know, there, there are online events that are happening and you know, some pretty creative ways of getting people together and mm -hmm. stuff, maybe not on the grand scale that some of these in-person events would have been, but um, you know, still finding ways to get people together, share your message. Because you know, they didn't want people, people didn't want, uh, the county didn't want people gambling with their credit card. So they put a, they, they stopped that um, aspect of it. Like we were just getting ready. We were a week away from kicking off our online um, auction, but um, they, they kind of, our Dolphin County said no to it now. Um, so that was another one that we can have, that we can have. But um, I live in a rural community and I work with individuals with extraordinary needs. So it's, what is actually happening with the with the horses and the healing that is happening so with, uh, that was our biggest thing like getting people to come to see grace blakers in operation then that's hooked you know i can't and me not being able to go out and speak to different places for the um for the fundraise or for the donations and everything like that it's hard um because me being an instructor for what we do is we're therapeutic horsemanship so I'm teaching individuals with extraordinary needs how to ride it. Just myself, um, taking video as I am teaching the lesson. You know what I mean? So that's where that's where I fall into problems with kind of getting the story out without me going out and talking to businesses. Like um, we're sponsored by Faulkner Subaru, um, the Woodman Life. So we have the, the two good sponsors that are really behind us and everything, but I'm trying to get more involved that people can see. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would say businesses in general, not just nonprofits, but there's been a lot more embracing of online marketing this year. You know, obviously, okay. online marketing is nothing new. A lot of businesses have been doing it for many, many years. Uh, but those who haven't embraced it in the past have realized how important it is to embrace now. 
Um, and, and that's kind of what you want to do. You know, it, it, you, you got to put your marketing hat on a little bit and figure out how do we reach our audience and share our story? How do we show the need that exists, you know, to our community and that we are that intermediary that can, you know, help, you know, provide the service that's needed with the appropriate funding. Um, and it can be, you know, as simple as running awareness campaigns on Facebook, you know, and other social media platforms. You know where your donations usually come from. You know the demographics and the, you know, the type of people you're trying to reach. And guess what? Facebook has all that data on its users. Whether we like to admit it or not, Facebook knows, you know, who you are. You know, what, what are, you know based on what you're doing on Facebook, what are your interests and, you know, what are your demographics? And now as marketers, we need to use that opportunity, you know, use that information to reach the people we want to reach. So, you know, putting together video and putting together case studies and being able to show the right types of people, here's what's happening in your community. And here's why we need your support more than ever. Um, you know, I, I think that's the angle you probably need to take. And I'll okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to I'm going to send you some connections. Um, one's going to be to Abby, who runs a nonprofit that I sit on the board of called Say It With Clay. We just had our big annual event um, last week. Actually, we had an online auction as well where you could buy clay masks that the participants created. Um, the thing the thing that we discussed quite a bit is exactly your question. However, one of the answers that I provided is that just like in Kevin's case as a business owner, he's spending less money this year than he did last year. In the case I of an individual, <clears throat> they're saving more money this year than they have probably in every year of their employment if they obviously have been able to maintain their salary, right? So that's less trips to networking, less coffees at Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts. Um, all these things that add into a nice donation opportunity. So I think, you know, the objective here is obviously be able to get the message out. However, it doesn't have to just be focused on businesses and organizations. Everybody's saving money this year. I mean, if you are still able to maintain your salary, you have money to spend. However, you just need something to apply it to at the point that you can convey its worth and value. And I think um, just to just to not be short-sighted at any kind of um, in any kind of ways that 2020 could actually probably force you to be right. You know, you're looking at your opportunities as dwindling when maybe they're not, you know, you just haven't reached the right demographic of people um, mm -hmm. or the right networks of support. Um, but, you know, again, for us, having just had these conversations all year, we threw not just the online auction piece of it, um, we had in-person opportunities too um, over a couple of days. And, um, you know, between marketing online, using the support of board members in our community, uh, and all the other pieces that I mentioned, you know, we were able to make something happen and, and do it well. At least I thought we did it well. So, you know, at the end of the day, we all have to figure this out. We all have to adapt to the change of landscape and the opportunities are still there. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add one more to that, even though I think we may have just lost John. Um, I'll add one more to that. And John can see this on the, uh, on the replay. <laughs> Um, there. to that extent, when, yeah. when Tyrone mentioned, um, you know, <clears throat> that funds are available and what are they going to invest in, what is going to be worth that value. One thing that I would recommend you do is, you know, have a little discussion with your three, four, five top donors or folks who really are supporting your organization and figure out what they're interested in, you know, what would entice them to get involved in terms of like a virtual event or opportunity. Maybe they're all, they all love wine. Maybe that's a common thread amongst people who support your organization. So maybe you can have an online wine tasting mixer sort of an event. Um, there's companies that actually produce that for you. There's an upcharge in the ticket and all of that difference is the donation that goes back to you. And then you're even asking for donations in the process of the event. Um, but finding out what those who support you would wanna get involved in can give you that great opportunity to create that 
uh, fundraising opportunity uh, that you know you may not have ever thought of in the past. Um, so that could be another good place to start. Okay. And associations with other groups that are similar or have a similar target demographic, you know. So um, your nonprofit and the nonprofit I just mentioned, say it with play, same exact demographic. You may not think about it that way, but it absolutely is the same exact target demographic. So if you think outside the box a little bit, um, you may be able to find some associations that you can partner with to be able to kind of pick up some uh, opportunities and give some opportunities. Again, exact same demographic. Mm -hmm. So we're having the same conversations with the same people um, to support missions that support the same groups of people. So there's okay. plenty of opportunities to try to figure out who also serves your demographic and say, hey, you know, this is what we have planned. You know, you just mentioned you couldn't do your auction. I just mentioned we did our auction, right? Maybe there was an opportunity to be able to jump in on our piece in some kind of way, you know? Right. Um, again, so just sure. think about it outside the box because you're not the only nonprofit that's having this question. As Kevin said, it is the question of the year for every nonprofit. Okay. Yeah, I know uh, like there's another, it's called Perry County. They still are able to do it since they're a different county. It's just for some. Mm -hmm. I can talk to one of the fire companies over there because we do. I mean, we, we have seven different counties, and I'm sure one of the counties would allow us to piggyback, piggyback off of one of their options. Absolutely. So didn't even Without think of that. Point. Okay. Well, no, this is uh, – thank you for that, uh, John. We yeah. do appreciate, uh, please appreciate that. We always want folks to chime in and let us know about what they're dealing with and, and if we can provide any advice. Um, to all folks, again, who are joined us here or who are watching on Facebook, you can contact – Tyrone at the email that's on the screen right now. Um, great dude to chat with, has great uh, ideas and, and ways to structure business. Um, you can also reach out to us here at Navitas Marketing. We're at Energy at Navitas Marketing, and we do uh, free consultations to, again, do some strategy and discuss uh, business growth uh, with folks who are interested. So again, thank you all for, for joining us. Um, any uh, last remarks, Kevin or Tyrone? No, uh, uh, just as you said, um, awesome discussion today, Tyrone. Uh, you know, thanks for joining us. Great, you know, great, great topics, great, great ideas, great thoughts. To everybody who joined us uh, on, you know, live today. Thanks for for uh, chiming in, and um, you know, had a had a great dialogue, had a great conversation, and this was a really good way to end our 2020 Thursday Thoughts series. Um, and I know we're all just excited to end 2020 in general. Um, so, uh, yeah, Tyrone, you, you got anything you want to add? No, just a thank you for having me. And um, I hope this can help some folks figure out their uh, next several months, because I, I know we're not out of this current scenario. So just wishing everybody the best.